want to talk first about relationship consequences. Relationships have consequences. I like to focus on one consequence. This. That is my son. And that is why I was missing for the last two and a half weeks. Uh, I still have a son, so I'm like, now, I'm, now that I'm back, he's grown up, he's not driving yet. But I just want to thank Tom Bradbury for uh, taking care of class while I was away. You uh, saw the guy that trained me. He is the master. I am Grasshopper. <laughs> so now I will try to live up to his, uh, his standard. But this is why I was gone, because he was born on Friday, April 10th. All right, back to business. Let's say you want to study for the midterm on Friday. How would you do it? Here's a good way. Read all of the assigned chapters in the text. The lectures draw from the text. And the um, text, of course, draws from the text. And so if you know the text, you're in very, very good shape. Uh, my lectures and Tom's really drew a lot from the text. We, we wrote the text. We put everything in the text that we thought was important to know. So I strongly advise knowing the text. Now, what if there's something in the text that was never mentioned in lecture? Do you still have to know it? Yes, yes that's right. You totally do. So, for example, if you had a choice between missing the lectures or not reading the book, I would skip the lectures. Although, you know, the lectures are good. They're trying to elaborate. But the text is really crucial. So know the text. Understand the concepts in the text. The point of this course is to change the way you think about intimate relationships, right? It's to, think, it's to, to change the way you maybe live your own intimate relations, but certainly observe other people's intimate relationships. So uh, I'm testing you on the things I want you to actually know that'll change your life. So you will not be tested on things that, you, that won't change your life. So you won't be tested on the names of researchers. I'll never say, here's a study, A, B, C, which is the name of the researcher that did this study? We're not going to do that. Uh, we will not be tested on numbers. Like, um, the percentage of people in this study who answered X was 40%, 50%, 60%. I'm not going to ask you that. It doesn't matter. And I'm not going to ask you to post tests on dates. What was the year that this study was done? I'm not interested in that, and nor should you be. You will have to understand the concepts. So there are, there are words, there's vocabulary I want you to know. In the text, though, a lot of those vocabulary words are underlined or bolded, uh, and, but some of them aren't. There's studies that I want you to understand because they prove something interesting about the human condition. So uh, I want you to understand what a research study proved, what it showed, what, the, what, what it revealed about intimate relationships. But that's part of understanding the concepts. You won't be having to understand this stuff. A comment that has come up a lot while I was away is, hey, the text is referring to a figure and I can't find the figure. Well, let me explain. This text is a draft. This is a rough draft. The uh, figure, a lot of the figures that we look forward to having in the final version of the text haven't been done yet. They don't exist. So if, uh, a lot of the figures that are missing are missing because they do not exist. <laughs> Therefore, you probably don't have to see the figure. Uh, you have to know the concepts. Hopefully the text does a good enough job of illustrating what you need to know. So if you uh, are reading the text and it refers to a figure and there's no figure, that's okay. Relax. That's just sort of one of those crazy things. And if there is a figure, bonus. Uh, another tip, study alone, review with friends. People who are in social psychology understand that that is a very, very good tip. Study alone, read the text alone, concentrate alone, and then uh, review with friends. If you can find, if there's people you know who are in this course, it really helps to review with other people. Uh, the test is written. Lisa read the test. She, she said all the answers make sense to her. They also make sense to me. It is, uh, a f you know, it's a, the test is not designed to trick. It's not designed to trick you. It's designed to be straightforward. I do recommend, though, that you read the questions carefully and know what they're asking. So something I do a lot, I'll just tell you, is I'll say, um, which one of the following five choices is false? Which means that four choices are true, and the right answer is the one that's not true. You might ask, why 
do I write so many questions that way? And I'll tell you, because they're easier to write than here are five things, four of which are plausible but, mis but wrong, and one that's true. It's much easier to write four things that are true and one thing that's plausible but wrong. So that's why a lot of the questions are formed that way. And since you know that, now you'll be ready for those kind of questions. Uh, any questions about the midterm? Because it's a big part of your grade, and I can understand if people have a little anxiety, I'd like to reduce your anxiety. Question? Yes. Lisa? It's going to be question and answer, but it's going to be by lecture. So Got it. You might structure it by like lecture or chapter, since, and, which is the same thing since they go together. A right. uh, question? What's your name? Um, question, question midterm, anyone know? 50. And the final? Also 50. Next week, at the beginning of lecture, I will talk about the paper the paper that's due in between the two tests. But for now, let's not talk about the paper. Let's focus on the midterm. Qu question back? Yeah. Will, the be put will the review session be put online? Great question. No. <laughs> they will not be recording the review session. So if you're here for the review session, that's awesome. And if you are watching at home, um, sorry. All right. Then uh, let's talk about today. Let's talk about today. The goal of this course is to give you information that changes the way you think about intimate relationships, that gives you conceptual tools for understanding the complexities, the massive complexities of intimate relationships. And today, since it's the day before, the lecture before our first midterm, uh, it might be a good, a good idea to try to apply what we've learned so far towards understanding actual relationships. And to that effect, or to, to, to that end, I want to show you something. I want to show you clips from a movie. And so this is, uh, I, Tom is awesome with film clips. Me, not so much. This is actually probably one of the, one of the last film clips I will show you in this course. But we're going to show, watch some pretty lengthy clips, about 10, 15 minutes each, and then we'll talk about them. So what am I going to show you? This is a documentary called Married in America. And it's directed by a guy named Michael Apted, who is very famous in Britain for directing a series of documentaries called the Seven Up series. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the Seven Up series. Oh, not that many of you? Oh, this is something for you to put in your Netflix queue. Here's what he did in Britain. Let me just tell you what he did in Britain. Okay, Michael Apted, who, by the way, also directed a couple of James Bond movies. So he's, he's like, directed a bunch of stuff. But he's, he's going to, when, when he dies, the obituary will mention this, the 7-Up series. Here's what they did. Uh, they got footage. They did a documentary of seven-year-old kids in Britain. And then they do the same, they follow the same kids every seven years. And right now, the last one is, like, 52 up. And you can actually get them all on DVD. So there's 7 up, 14 up, 21 up, 28 up. And like when I first started watching the movies, there was 28 up. That's when the one I saw first. And now, of course, up to 52 up, which gives you a sense of time passing. The point being that he got an idea to do the same sort of thing in the United States, but instead of focused on like individuals growing up, he focused on marriage. And the question is, what happens to marital relationships? So well, that's highly relevant to our course. Our course is not only about marital relationships, it's about all sorts of rela intimate relationships, but marriages certainly count, and marriage is a, a highly impactful relationship for a lot of individuals. In fact, for many, it's the most impactful intimate relationship they'll have in their lifetime. So he did a series of movies. But so far, he's done two where he basically got nine couples who were about to be married, and he filmed them a lot. And he put together a movie called Married in America, which basically follows each of these couples from engagement through their wedding day. And the goal of the project is to come back every five years and see how these couples are doing, to follow the course of their lives, to answer the question that is fundamentally the question of this course which is, what happens to newlyweds? Uh, what happens to a couple, may not be newlyweds, who are together and happy 
And then what happens? We know what they want. They tell us what they want. They want to stay happy. That's what I want. That's what you want. Well, who succeeds? Who fails? And what determines the difference? I'm not going to show you the whole film because it's lengthy. But I'll show you a couple of clips. And we'll see how many we have time for. Um, we'll start with one clip. And uh, I think I've got it queued to the right place. And it's a couple that uh, or you see that, that they're engaged and will follow them through their wedding day. And it takes about 15 minutes. And then I'm going to stop it. And, I and here are the questions I want you to think about while we're watching. I want you to think, how does the stuff we've talked about in this course apply to helping us understand these people and where they're coming from? So for example, Tom talked about attraction. Well, do we see any of those principles at work here when they talk about how they got together and how they met? We talked about all these theories. We spent a whole week talking about five different theories of intimate relationships. Well, try it on. As part of, this is almost part of reviewing for the midterm. Think about it. If you were an evolutionary psychologist, what would you have to say about these two? If you were a social learning theorist, what would you have to say about these two? What role does social exchange play? What role does attachment play? What role does the social ecology play? The goal, what I hope happens as you watch this, is two things. One is, you'll say, wow, this is, this is interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to be fascinated by how relationships form. Two, I'm hoping you'll say, wow, this stuff really works. The stuff we've talked about in this course actually helps me, gives me insight into this couple that I wouldn't have otherwise had. That's the goal, at least. Let's see if we can make that happen. Let's watch the first clip. I want to go through at least two. But let's watch the first clip, Cheryl and Neil. And let's see what, what we can learn from them. All right, we'll get back to Carol and Chuck in a moment. <clears throat> so that was Cheryl and... How's that? Better? 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 All right, that was Cheryl and Neil. And uh, if you're like me, and I, I, I'm pretty, I can tell that you are, that um, <clears throat> you, you went through and you were thinking about the lectures from the first half of this course and, uh, and saying, wow, there it is, bang, bang, oh my goodness, oh that connects to this, that connects to this. What did you see? Anyone want to want to tell something that they saw that sort of related to something? Like, tell me your name. Natalie. Natalie. Nicely said. I thought of the same thing. Like, how do they meet? Proximity. Clearly, they just happen to be near each other, and so that was that was an initial necessary condition for them getting together. What's your name? Uh, Jacob. Jacob. So we got proximity. Check. We got similarity. Check. The fact that he reads, she found, oh, that's very appealing. Uh, what else you got? Uh, tell me your name. Wyatt. Wyatt, right. Well, Wyatt raises a very interesting point if you're, if you're thinking about this couple. So what Jacob says, oh, they, they, when they're talking about why they have got together, they emphasize their similarities. But Wyatt points out, well, to the extent that similarity really matters for a long-term relationship, there's also a major issue for them that they don't, that they're, where they're not similar, and that's religion. And we might say, oh, well, how, you know, how is that going to play out over the course of these people's lives? Uh, what's your name? Brittany. Brittany. That's very, very interesting. So Brittany points out that of the two of them, the one we see predicting the future more is her, uh, which is consistent with, something, with the idea that women are sort of more barometers of the relationship or doing more relationship thinking. She's like thinking about the relationship more, whereas he's thinking about what's on his mind? Residency. Where is he going to get his residency? Absolutely. Uh, uh, what else? Do you, do you know? Tell me your name. Melissa. Melissa. Um, she was the one that had like, the laundry list of Absolutely. Consistent with this idea of gender differences, that of the two of them, the one that, A, has the laundry list of issues, 
In other words, has thought enough about the relationship to have a laundry list of issues, and B, says, I'm making the time to talk about them, and where are you, is, of course, her and not him. He's the one who says, you know, as long as, as, long as uh, you're here and we're having breakfast together, I don't have any other issues. What's, what's, what's your name? Liz? Okay, so Liz, for those of you watching back home, Liz in the back just said that she observed that he, uh, that she interrupted more. And so she, uh, Liz interprets that, that uh, to mean that she has more power in the relationship. Other people, um, that's an interesting idea. Of the two of them, who do you think has more power in the relationship? Do people agree with Liz? Yeah, yeah the general consensus that they do. What would give Liz, what, would, what gives Cheryl more power in this relationship? What's that? Money, did you say? Exactly. It's very interesting to think about this, about the, the two of them, because right now, uh, right, he's in residency, and he's saying, in the future, I will make a lot of money, but right now, I don't make any money. So they're living together, right? It's, which means someone's paying rent, someone's paying electricity bills, and it looks like it's her. So he's basically being uh, supported entirely by her, and one gets the impression that that's not insignificant in their relationship. It's a hugely significant part that um, he's acutely aware of his dependence on her. And we learn, so what theory, Liz, what theory are you thinking about when you're thinking about this issue of sort of dependence, who's got more power? Perfect, Liz gets it right. She totally says social exchange theory, which is accurate. Uh, other thoughts? Hey, yes, what's your name? Brian. Of evolutionary theory. Very nice. That's really a great point. So, so Brian says, Brian puts on the, the hat of an evolutionary psychologist. And he says, what does an evolutionary psychologist pick out of that? And Brian, wearing that hat, says, the evolutionary psychologist says, well, what's in it for her? What she's thinking, I am going to pick a mate that is going to support me and support me in having children, and support my children. And... Um, and indeed, we saw that, and it was such a cute, we all laughed when, when uh, the interviewer said, the interviewer who happens to be Michael Apted himself says, you know, do you want kids? And she says, yes. And he says, hmm. Because <laughs> he, he, for, for him, immediately having kids isn't necessarily a priority. Uh, other thoughts? What's your name? Uh, Micah. Micah, right. Uh, Wonderful. Micah makes a really great point that the, that the, the mom, the mother-in-law, says uh, to herself, well, I'm not that fond of my son. I mean, initially, she's quite cool to her son's wife because, as Micah points out, the evolutionary psychologist, I'm not related to my son's wife. We've got no genes in common. But when she imagines grandchildren, she says, oh, no, I'm going to love my grandchildren. Of course, of course, that's where her genetic inheritance is. What's your name? Jordan. Jordan. Isn't that fantastic, Jordan? Did you hear what Jordan just said? So Jordan now is putting on a different theory. What theory is she trying on? Attachment theory. So she's wearing that hat and she's saying, what does an attachment theorist point out? It says, attachment theorist says, we learn about intimacy from our, um, our, our relationship with our parents. And so what do we see in the video? We saw, how did he meet his wife? He met his wife where he had overslept he comes to some meeting, and there, the woman that said, let me take care of you and guide you to where you need to be, oversleeper, that's the woman he ends up proposing. <laughs> huh, who else in his life might have also said, you know, Neil, come on, little guy, we got to get to school. I mean, like, what, what, was, what was romantic about that for him? What's, what's your, tell me your name again. David, David right. Absolutely. It's really, really true. 
So, so um, that she has this, well, what's interesting is that uh, no one can agree on her personality. Her mom says that she's a yeller, but then she says, well, maybe she's not a yeller now. So there's a sense that, that her, how her personality manifests is affected by who she's with. Uh, Wyatt. That's a very good point, Wyatt. On average, on average, when men and women are videotaped talking to each other, men interrupt more. But a lot of research on that has shown, I don't know if Tom talked about this, that if you actually pull peop, uh, men, and, if you put men and women together but you change the power, you actually put women in a position of power, that you can flip that difference. It turns out that whoever's in the more powerful position tends to interrupt more. A lot of time that is men, but when it's women, women interrupt just as much as men do. Was there, Luke? Yeah, I guess um, the, the, if I was like the, the wife, she's not really seeing it from, I guess, the socio-ecological perspective of she's married to a, a budding doctor. I mean, that's just part of life if you're married to a doctor is that you're not going to be able to be there all the time for the kids or for everything else that she wants. Luke points out, now Luke wears a different theory. So Luke puts on the social, social ecologist hat. By the way, I don't know what hat I'm talking about, but I'm... <laughs> So Luke puts on that social ecologist hat where he says, oh, look, how is this family, this budding new family, affected by circumstances outside of them? Well, let's list it. What are the circumstances outside of this family that affect them? And number one that Luke points out is that he has got a job that requires serious hours. And the last thing that they say is, while we're watching video of them dancing on chairs, we hear her say, I am resigning myself to the fact that he won't be available. That's pretty significant. I mean, think of how that affects their relationship. So then they're in therapy, and she's saying, you know, uh, I want to talk about all these issues, and you're too tired. Now, why is he too tired? Is it because he's a guy and he doesn't care to talk about these issues? Is it because he doesn't care enough about her to talk about her issues? Or is it because he's got a really difficult job, and he's been up for 48 hours being, you know, um, um, doing all the worst jobs in his residency. It's, it, what's really interesting about watching them is you can see how at, at the beginning of a relationship, she's saying, oh, I know it's his job. But you can imagine that, I, I don't know what's going to happen to them in the future, but you can imagine that in the future, she, it might be harder for her to remember that it's the job that, means that, that makes him difficult to talk to about difficult issues or reluctant to talk about difficult issues. You can imagine, unless she keeps reminding herself about the job, she may start blaming him for that. Possible. Uh, what's your name? Megan. Megan. Uh, they interrupt with different uh, family background, like relationships, like her parents' divorce, that makes her um, fear and divorce. Um, That's an outstanding point. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Is this, is this coming through? We have eight minutes. Let me ask you. Chuck and Carol, do they love each other? Do you believe that? Yeah. They, do you believe that, that they want to make it work? Yeah. Like, uh, I believe it too. I totally believe it. They're from the bottom of my heart. They are people who've been through, let's, let's uh, by any stretch of the imagination, difficult circumstances. And they want to make it work. They want to raise their kids. They want to be in love. They, I, they ended on a dream, and they really want that dream to come true. And the dream talks about things outside themselves, a house. But they're talking about, the, but the foundation of that dream is the bond, the intimate bond between them. They want it. They're committed to it. There's nothing, there's nothing, um, and also they have no illusions. They know what they've been through, and they're willing to talk about it. What, let's just list it. What would make it hard for these two to maintain intimacy over a long period of time? Yeah, where to begin? Give it a try. Tell me your name. Cassie. Cassie. So Cassie says his low self-esteem and dependence on her for, for reason for living might be a difficult burden for her to bear in the long run. Oh, uh, 
Sarah? Sarah? Poverty predicts divorce, and these people are poor. We know that. They don't make a lot of money. Tell me your name? Um, Elise. Elise, right. The fact that they've both been divorced before. They've both been divorced, by my sense, multiple times before is going to make it hard. We know that, they, that they have, they've been in bad relationships and walked away from them in the past. Tell me your name. Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, he's walking a tightrope, isn't he? I mean, he, like, there's, there's things. He could go to prison again, and that would be the end of his life. Something, something, something. Tell me your name. Kayla. Kayla. Um, the lack of trust. The lack of trust. Now, you know, there's some people who are just not trusting people. On the other hand, in this case, you might have to say, well, there's some basis for a bit of a lack of trust. You could imagine. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's, you know, they both... Uh, especially he's had a difficult life and, and proven himself to, in the past, be uh, slightly, slightly unreliable. Was there something else? S Sabrina? Um, Absolutely. Put on your attachment theory hat. Absolutely. They both come from, from uh, difficult childhoods, even though his parents didn't divorce. They certainly, clearly, it sounds like there wasn't a lot of love. He didn't hear, hear a lot of expressions of love. And, and she, of course, was abused as a child. So they, they know, it's interesting, he says, I know what not to do. But that's not the same as knowing what to do. Having a model of what not to do doesn't help you resist that model if that's the only model you've got. Was it, was it Megan? Oh, that's so interesting, Megan. Is that for her, if she cares about him at all, there's a, there's a powerful disincentive to report him because she knows that he would be sent away for life. And she's like, well, I'm mad at him, but am I willing to send him away for life? Oh, that's a really good point. Now, here's an interesting thing. Michael Apted, the director, you can hear him in his, with, his, with his upper crust British accent asking, uh, what did your parents teach you not to do? They ask him. And he says, okay. What, what did I learn? What did I learn from my parents? What did he learn? Do you remember what he learned? Don't call names. Don't hit. Don't raise your voice. Don't degrade. Any arguments with that advice? That's great advice. That's terrific. That's social learning theory in a nutshell, right? Hey, if you know those things, then you've got the relationship skills. Here's your diploma. Go forth. What's the problem? Problem is, it's not enough to know that those things are good. Hey, I know those things are good, too. We all know those things are good. Everyone knows them. Even a guy who's been in prison twice and is a registered sex offender knows, oh, it's not good to hit intimate partners. But he still did it. It's not good to degrade. And also, I don't think he feels particularly good about cheating on his prior partners. That's, none of that's good. You know it. The question we ask in this course, or one question that we should ask in this course, and maybe we don't know, we haven't answered it yet, is why is it hard? Why is it so hard to do what we all know is the right thing to do? They know what the right thing to do is. The right thing to do is to love the heck out of each other forever and to love their kids. But we're, we're saying, to, we're, we're already using the, 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 what we've learned so far in this course about individual differences, about the different theoretical perspectives, to identify for ourselves, wow, wanting it, believing in it. That's not, that may not be enough. That may not be enough. Let me ask you then, in our last, last two minutes, last thir two seconds, what do you think is going to happen to them? Five years later, they are divorced. Class dismissed.